fear and excitement at the same time. My very first story ever was basically the Parent Trap fan fiction. By the time I got to the second book, I thought, well, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and this is the very first episode of our very first season. So we're going to take inspiration from Dylan Thomas and begin at the beginning. In this episode beginnings, we'll be hearing from recently knighted Python, Sir Michael Palin, Waterstones Children's Book Prize category winner, Tomi Adeyemi. And in the studio, we are joined by best-selling author, screenwriter and recent BAFTA winner, David Nichols. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. Very Excited to be here. The first, first one. The very first one. <laughs> I'm also joined by my co-hosts, Holly Davis and Dan Bird. Hello to both of you. Hi. Hello. We you are didn't going get to... as nice a welcome, though. Well, you win a BAFTA. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're better get to I'll, I'll write you a better intro. <laughs> um, so, What on Earth is the Waterstones podcast? It is a books podcast, but with a slight difference. Each episode will have a different theme, so you will get the chance to hear from a range of authors talking about the things that obsess us all. So in this first season, after beginnings, will come friendship, sex, perfection, success and family. And as well as authors in the studio, we'll hear clips from interviews and events from around the country. And as a way to introduce ourselves as hosts and to hear more about our guest, David Nichols, I thought we could all share our beginnings with books. Because David, I believe that you, like Holly and Dan here, were once a Waterstones bookseller. I was, yeah. And I think it must have been about 93, 94 the Notting Hill branch, uh, I was in charge of the children's department. I was very proud of it. And I was trying at that time to be an actor, which meant that I was not really acting. I was working <laughs> I was working a lot at Waterstones. I had uh, very nice managers who were very tolerant of me going out and auditioning every now and then. But I really loved it. I was very happy there, and it was a really nice branch. Um, it was very busy. Uh, I, lots of celebrities used to come in. I sold Julia Roberts uh, a, a book once, which was very exciting, a lot of excitement in the shop. And yeah, I was there on and off for a couple of years. You sold a book to Julia Roberts in a Notting Hill bookshop. I shop. know. Are you it's uh, uh, man, <laughs> isn't it? help but feel yeah, something's that going was, on here? Maybe there was something in that idea. No, it was a copy <laughs> of Rilke, I think, and she had two bodyguards who sort of stood a little way off and browsed in the fiction section and yeah I sold her Wilkes collected poems wow oh my God. <laughs> that is not what I would have expected but it just sort of makes the story even better in yeah. a way. Holly and Dan why don't you tell us a little bit about your beginnings at Waterstones I started working as a bookseller in the High Wycombe branch a Diddy branch in Buckinghamshire when I was still in sixth form at school and again I was in the children's section and started as a Christmas temp and they what I really remember from that time is that they had a fantastic fish tank in the children's section (laughs) that the children just seemed to be slightly more interested in when their parents would bring them but it was just lovely it was a really nice atmosphere to the bookshop and then I moved to the Oxford branch when I went to university and during my time at the Oxford branch I actually came to Piccadilly for a signing to meet the one and only Miranda Hart. <laughs> <laughs> and whilst meeting Miranda, I looked around and I saw all these people doing their jobs in the events, the event that I was at at the signing. And I thought, wow, this must be what these people do for their full time job. And then that's when I realised yeah. that I wanted to work in events at Waterstones. And here we are. And here you are we, working four in years events. years later. Yeah. The dream came true. Absolutely. Dan, how about you? Where did you begin? I began here at Piccadilly Ah. three and a half years ago, something like that. Um, And then shortly after went out to Islington, where we also had a fish tank, which was slightly less pleasant than your (laughs) fish tank. I know know that fish tank. It's my local branch, so I'm very familiar with the fish in that fish tank. Or absence of fish, (laughs) as as the case may be. Um, But I, I too have a... Um, a celebrity story from my time in Islington being that I was in the kind of hardback history section shelving you know as you do as a bookseller and someone leant over the top of me to get a book and I was like that's so rude just leaning over me like kind of not even subtly kind of I think his knee hit my back a bit as he was grabbing the book so I turned around to kind of give him a you know like a tut or an angry stare and it was Ray Fiennes and I was like oh I can't have a go at Ray Fine, so I just kind of smiled and carried on with my shelving. 
I think I'd be too scared to have a go at Ray Fiennes. Yeah, how can you? He's played too many scary characters. Yeah, um, he was very nice about it. He apologised, so it was all okay. Um, <laughs> and then after Islington, I moved here um, to Piccadilly, where I do the events currently. I feel like a bit of an interloper here because I, I was not a Waterstones bookseller, technically. Um, mm. But my beginnings with books, I suppose, happened... It was to do with... I, I gave my wife one of my favourite books to read, which is um, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. Mm-hmm. And uh, by Michael Chabon, which is an amazing book. Mm-hmm. And she was about halfway through it. And I remember I looked across and I said, oh, you know, where are you up to? And she said, oh, he's just walking to the Antarctic with his dog. And I thought, I don't know what she's talking about. Yeah, I, don't I don't remember that bit at all. And I thought, why do I not remember a really quite crucial bit of plot detail? And it's because I was reading so much. It was just, I was reading books, enjoying them, and then, then just dumping them out of mm-hmm. my head. Mm-hmm. And I think part of that was because at the time I was an actor and I was so used to learning lines for a job you do the job and then as soon as it finishes the lines just disappear because you've got to make room for some more to go in and I thought I need to remember what I'm reading more so I started to write a book blog online I didn't know what I was doing or why I was doing it other than to remember what I was reading and then suddenly I became part of this online book community I was making friends with people who were also writing reviews of books and eventually I got to meet some of them but that's how I ended up sort of I suppose becoming involved with books professionally was just through sharing what I was reading with people online. So that's how I find myself in this room with you Waterstones wow, booksellers. Amazing. And two actors in our midst. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I have to ask you, David, because you mentioned there about your your previous career as an actor. Yes. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Because there's yeah. a definite whiff of the theatrical with Sweet Sorry, your new book. I mean, I did a, I did a lot of fringe productions and I got my equity card. I, did, I studied English and drama at university, but academically. Mm. And I did a lot of, you know, plays it there and I, I didn't really I wasn't a big theatre lover you know I kind of did plays because that's how you get to be involved in stories and characters and mm. I didn't I didn't love that world but I wanted to continue for a little longer so I I trained and then I got into equity and I did a lot of you know shows above pubs and bits and pieces and when I was working at Waterstones I got an audition at the National Theatre to be uh, an understudy in Arcadia Tom Stoppard's Arcadia, Amazing. which you know, I had no idea that it would turn out to be the play that it became, but um, that was a fantastic break, and I spent years and years at the National, sort of five or six years there, but playing tiny parts. I mean, <laughs> quite often not going on stage at all, quite yeah. often if I was on stage just standing at the back, so I was a sort of silhouette, a piece of furniture really, I just kind of got moved around. Once I'd left the National, I kind of... Um, I realised that I wasn't really, you know, I was employed there because I was fantastically keen <laughs> and reliable and I would learn the lines and I would turn up and not complain. But I don't think anyone was desperate to see me, you know, do more. So I, 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 was, um, I was reading a lot of play scripts for various theatres as a kind of freelance reader. Freelance script reading became script editing and there was one day, I think in about 1996, where I had to I'd auditioned for the RSC to play Valentine in Twelfth Night on a world tour for two years. And Valentine has maybe two lines. I think. <laughs> the heart my lord hath fled, I think he says in the first scene, and that's it. And <laughs> so it's to understudy Orsino and play Valentine for years going around the world. Mm. But I'd also had a, there was a possibility of a job reading, sort of reading the slush pile for BBC Radio Drama. And I had to choose between the two jobs, and I took the the reader job at the BBC mm. and that was it no more acting after that except one film role my film role uh, it, which film role is a big word for it actually <laughs> I mean um, you know that Stephen Frears film The Deal about Blair and Brown yeah I have one line in that I come into the room and I say ready when you are Mr Mandelson and that's it <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like we were there yeah <laughs> Of course, you know, you mentioned that you're, you're doing a lot of understudy work whilst you're at yeah. National, and of course, you, you've written a novel, The Understudy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, as I said, there is this definite theatrical feel to your new novel, Sweet Sorrow, yeah. which, could you tell us a bit more about Sweet Sorrow? Yes, I mean, it's about, it, 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 it's sort of glancingly about amateur dramatics and theatre, it's about, a, but it's from the point of view of someone who hates that world, you yeah. know, who really doesn't want to be a part of that. It's not a kind of sort of lush, lovey novel, it's about someone who thinks it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's about this kid, 16-year-old kid, who's just sort of flunked his um, his GCSEs and isn't really sure what he's doing with his life and is a bit stuck and, and desperately wants something to change. And he meets this girl and, you know, it's a first love story, so they fall in love. Uh, and she's spending the summer 
doing Romeo and Juliet in this you know, country house. And he realizes the only way to be with her is to be in it. And so he he gets the part of Benvolio, one of those boring kind of watching <laughs> yeah. parts, those slightly bland roles. And, and it's the, the story of this summer um, uh, set against the background of this production. Um, but it's really about being 16 and not being sure what you want to do with your life and feeling awkward. And it was really an, a sort of antidote to the, the, the last couple of books I've written, which are about you know characters who are slightly older, mm. slightly later in life. I wanted to write something that was very kind of wide-eyed and nostalgic and, and warm and full of uh, that kind of confusion and elation of being 16. I mean, it has a darker strand to it as well. It's not mm. just a kind of sort of dopey first love novel it's it's quite bittersweet it has this these moments of darkness you you mentioned that, that the awkwardness of being 16 uh, even the the period it's set in i suppose is a little bit later than when i was that that age but yeah. it reminds me so much of being that age and uh, particularly i think that summer after exams yeah when you have this sort of i don't know you you've finished that big thing and you're not quite sure what's going to come next and so therefore you have this beautiful pocket of time in which something yes. magical can happen like falling in love yeah I and mean, that was the intention really to kind of capture this sort of little I mean it's said in 97 I wasn't 16 in 97 I was 16 <laughs> in 82 83 I think so it's it's not my youth but it is an attempt to recapture that feeling which of course isn't an experience I had I spent that summer working in a, a coffee percolator factory just week after week of uh, being indoors in this big old warehouse and I didn't have this amazing life-changing experience of falling in love and meeting all these people friends for life you know it was much grimmer than that so there's a there's a kind of fantasy element to it I suppose a kind of idealized version of what that can be like Mm. but yeah the length of the summer that feeling that sort of tipping point that happens at some point in the summer where you realize the days are getting noticeably shorter and Mm. it's coming to an end and September is looming and Mm. you're gonna have to make some changes and face up to reality so that was um this, the, it's an overused word for me anyway, but the bittersweetness of that time of life. I'm really intrigued to talk to you a bit more about the, the work that you went on to do, adapting things for, yeah. for screenplays. But before we do that, we're going to hear from another actor and author, Sir Michael Palin. So Michael, I think, has probably achieved national treasure status uh, mm. with all of his work. Um, he's had a career which has incorporated classic comedy, global travel and success as a writer. His most recent book, um, Erebus, is the story of HMS Erebus, which was the great exploring ship which went missing in the Arctic in 1848 and was recently discovered in 2014 on the bottom of the sea. Now, I wanted to know what a man who has travelled so far and seen so much would make of this word beginnings. Fear. Fear and excitement at the same time. I really, you know, you come up with an idea, you come up with something, you start a book or something like that, and you, you, you have to overcome the feeling you might be disappointed. And if you're not, and it works, then it's absolutely terrific. And I usually know f- very, very early on whether I'm going to be um, entranced by something or not. I mean, I, I, I really can tell from the first page, usually, of a book. I mean, sometimes books can very well written first page. It does take a long time, you just have to stick with it. But mm. generally speaking, that feeling of excitement, and that's like frisson, I'm going to be associated with this thing for a long, long time if it works. Oh, it doesn't. No, no, I don't <laughs> like you very much. So beginnings are very exciting moments. Do you have the same thing when you're writing comedy? I mean, when you sit down with a blank page and you know you have to write something mm. that's funny, is that terrifying as well? Or do you instantly know, you just kind of riff with your yes, colleagues with that? That's a kind of, yeah, I mean, that's a slightly different sort of thing in that you can have an idea about something that happens or some contrast that's really odd and then you can fill it out and that's that so the beginning is not absolutely the most essential thing you don't how can i begin to make this funny you 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 have an idea of a situation um where uh, what is going on can be funny someone in a restaurant sending back a fork and the you know the entire restaurant going into meltdown or something like that then you can write it all down it's so it's it's not quite um, as significant a beginning as it is starting um, a longer work or, or, or a book or even a journey. I mean, all the beginnings of my journey, I think that's why I said fear and excitement. When I've set out on all the big journeys I've done, uh, I've been you know, quite apprehensive, to say the least, mm. sometimes terrified. Mm. How on earth are we going to sort of 
sustain this and bring back the material? Where's, what's it all going to mean and how's it going to line up? People are going to take it and all that. And you never get beyond that. Even though you have one or two successes, you always have the, you're only as good as your, your, your next programme. Mm. David, do you recognise that feeling of fear and excitement? Yeah, I recognise the fear. I mean, I think <laughs> with a novel, you can become very fixated on openings and opening sentences, and you, you it inevitably gets worked over much more mm-hmm. than than other uh, maybe the other points in the book. And I also know that when I'm starting a novel or a script, that the first thing I write is not going to be the beginning. Mm. It's going to get buried, it's going to get crossed out, it's going to move somewhere else. That actually, that, that the important thing is just to get it down. And, and uh, when I start, it's been different every time, but usually when I start a book, I have a kind of a file that no one will ever see, no one will ever read. It's just a scrapbook that I can just tip stuff into and it will, it, it without any kind of fear or anxiety. So, the, you know, the, the, the cliche which you see in films of of the writer looking at the blank page, I understand the anxiety of that, but it very rarely works like that. Mm. There's never a, a moment of working out that perfect first sentence, for me anyway. It's just a big old sack of stuff that you throw stuff into and then pull out the pull things out later. Um, with a script, you know, it's very unlikely that the first scene will be the first scene of the yeah. finished thing, and very unlikely that the first draft will bear much relation to the finished version. You know, it's uh, it, for me much more than fiction. The, the the beginning is less important than the process, endless process of of rewriting. When you're adapting, that that is slightly different, isn't it? So obviously, the Patrick Melrose novels. Yes. Yeah. I loved those books yes, and yeah. I was sort of always slightly terrified of what might happen if they were filmed. In fact, there, yeah. had, there had been a film previously which, which I hadn't actually seen but I've seen since and was not great. Um, but adapting them for TV, maybe a slightly bigger mm. canvas, I suppose, in a way. And I have never been so gratified by watching TV series because it was exactly what I would have wanted from an adaptation. But how on earth did you begin that? Uh, I bought two copies of the book and I tore out the pages and I got a big folder full of A4 paper and I glued each page uh, of the novel to this blank page and I annotated it saying, you know, underlining not just the dialogue because that's your instinct when you're adapting a book is just to take out all the best Mm. bits of dialogue and Mm. write, you know, exterior, interior. I didn't do that. I, I sort of drew out the images and ideas and little things, things that were referred to in the past and whether we might see those and I... I worked very slowly on the first novel uh, for a long, long time. And by the time I got to the second book, I thought, well, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> it was a waste of time. It would have been so much easier just to read it a couple of times. Um, so uh, I wasn't quite as pedantic when I, as when I, when I, when I moved on to um, Bad News, the second novel in the sequence. Mm. Uh, but I worked on it for years and years and years, and, and it went through endless rewrites. I mean, there must be... 30, 40 drafts of every single episode. And they're not radically different, but they, 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 there were notes. Mm. And you know, that process continued right through production as well. So it was very um, protracted, but also very satisfying. I, I won't pretend that there weren't times where I thought, I really don't want to think about Patrick Mallorys ever again, <laughs> because it was six years of living in that world. Mm. Uh, the most useful thing I did actually was I, I, I had the audio books on my phone and I would just walk, if I was walking anywhere I would walk and listen so that that I, I kind of absorbed them and absorbed not just the, as I said, not just the dialogue and the main story points, they're not particularly story led but it wasn't just a case of transcribing the story and dialogue, it became much more about images, mood, uh, a feeling, an atmosphere which sounds a bit abstract, but that was as useful to me as the the mechanics of of, of dismantling the books. Mm. And um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I there was a lot of input from from cast and the director. That's hugely important. You know, it's very um, it's a cliche, but it's very collaborative. Much more so, much more collaborative than writing fiction. Even though I do get input with fiction, very valuable mm. input. A script. It's never going to be finished. I mean, at no point on any production I've ever worked on has anyone said, these scripts are done, don't change a word. Mm. Someone will always want to change something. And that can be maddening. Uh, If you're a very powerful screenwriter, you can say, no, that's it. I'm not going to change a word. But my experience is that when you change the words, they get better. I've never 
written a new draft that hasn't been better than the previous one. And if there have been elements that were better before, then the new, the old draft still exists. So mm. why can't you just go back to it and excavate? So I, even though I hate the rewriting process and resent it and I'm furious about it, I'm always retrospectively grateful for it. I was, I was going to hark back to this notion of fear and mm. excitement. Yeah. Um, and whilst I can't speak as an author or a writer or, or anything like that, I can speak as a reader. And <laughs> when I was at university, I did a course which was purely on Ulysses, um, which is always going to be a daunting task because yeah. it's such a mammoth mm. book. Mm. Um, and I distinctly remember the first class the lecturer opened by reading the first sentence, which runs, stately, plump, Buck Mulligan came down, came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. And he immediately said, sentence opens with stately, sentence closes with crossed. You have state, you have religion. He then mentioned plump, and he was like, plump, um, as, ties to plum like a plum line the scene ends with buck mulligan jumping into into like the sea or something um and i was just like oh christ what have i done <laughs> what have i done <laughs> and it was just like this uh, the excitement was there but the yeah. fear of just and he just kind of said every sentence in this novel you can go into that depth and i was just like oh Sweet yeah. Jesus. <laughs> what, I mean, excited or thr thrilled to be studying that? Or, or I mean, both. Or just daunted? It, it was it, very daunting. Yeah. I mean, if someone tells you, I mean, as a literature student, you're kind of born to kind of do the analysis work. But that yeah. level of analysis from the first sentence onwards was just overwhelming. But yes. the excitement was still there. It meant yeah. that there was a lot to kind of get your teeth into. But... Um, but that, that's the most, when he said the fear and excitement, that was the most distinct image in my head is being sat in that <laughs> seminar room like, oh dear, how am I going to do well in this course? I remember being so overwhelmed when I was maybe kind of in year six or year seven and a bookseller had recommended to my dad that I read The Book Thief by Marcus Susak. Mm -hmm. And I was a very small child and this was a very big book in hardback <laughs> and it had just come out. And I remember bringing it home and just being so overwhelmed by its size, sat on my bedside table. Mm. And I would chip away at a couple of pages a day and it took me over a whole term at school to read. Mm. But it was that kind of sense of excitement of wanting to carry on. But like it was a heavy book as well. Yeah. And I'd have to rest it down and things like that. But yeah. it is, it's the whole excitement of starting on that new journey and progressing and seeing how it develops. There's that thing with big books where I went through a phase of reading big books. Yeah. I think it was because I'd kind of got mm. matched fit after I'd read one big one it's a bit like running a marathon and you go I reckon I can do War and Peace now yeah. and yeah. so you pick up War and Peace and once you've read War and Peace you go right then Moby Dick you know and I yeah. went through yeah. and I read all of these gigantic books whereas now the idea of picking up anything over about 300 pages fills mm. me with fear because it's just I'm not I'm not fit I need to get yeah. back into the game yes I'm desperate for a bit of time to to get back into that I mean my, my 20s it felt this is the era of rave. I read Dickens, and then, <laughs> you know, I kind of, um, I really, and I, I, and it was a project. You know, I kind of was very excited to, mm. to pick up Martin Chuzzlewit and, <laughs> and and crack it open and get going. And I, I don't have that now. I, I'm slightly resentful of of length, especially working on TV and film, because you're sort of thinking, do we need this chapter? Yes. And, mm. you know, is this uh, is this uh, going off on a tangent? Is this repetitious? And of course, books don't have to replicate the experience of film or TV. You know, everything has to have a kind of strict narrative purpose. It's yeah. writing for writing. So I want to take us somewhere else now. I'm gonna we're gonna basically eavesdrop in on a, a Waterstones event, um, and this is uh, from last year with Tommy Adeyemi, who was speaking with Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff about her YA fantasy novel. Children of Blood and Bone. It's an amazing book and it went on to win the older fiction category uh, of the Waterstones Children's Book Prize in 2019. Now in this clip she's sharing a story uh, which just shows how representation is important for helping the youngest readers to begin their own forays into writing. It was after my event in Bristol. Uh, I think there was like about, it was like another ticketed event. I think there was 80 people and we had just wrapped up sort of this portion in the Q&A and so the signing line was forming here. Um, and as it's forming, this little, this little black queen, she was like this tall, she just has this look on her face. Like, you know, like it's sort of, it was both determination but also obliviousness. Um, and you know, as people are lining up here, she grabs her copy and she just 
just like marches down and because it was a row like this, it just looked, I said it was like Moses parting the Red Sea. <laughs> and she pops it down and she's like, hello. She's like, my, my, my name is Ava Ray. I, I wrote a s story and she just, it was, I, yeah, I don't, I, it was funny beforehand because we had a train to catch to get back to London. And so right, we were kind of strategizing. We're like, okay, well, you know, we'll do this. Well, I'll keep it. I tend to talk too much <laughs> to people. So I was like, we're going to keep it moving along. And literally as soon as she came, I was like, okay, throw it out. We're probably not getting back to London. Like I could listen to her forever. It was, it was so gratifying because I, I talk a lot about how I'm writing for the little Tommy mm -hmm. because when I was, the very first story I ever wrote, it was like, raise your hand if you've seen The Parent Trap. The Lindsay Lohan one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, the reason I clarify, I know it's not that necessary to clarify, but when I was really young and when Netflix was still a company that sent out DVDs, I remember thinking like, oh my God, I'm finally going to be in control of watching The Parent Trap. And I was with my little sister and we loved this movie. And so we get it and it's the one with the blonde twins. And we, we watched for two hours being like, I just don't remember this being. <laughs> you know, when is Lindsay going to come in? This seems like a very long, <laughs> Like introduction, but so the, it was the Lindsay Lohan parent trap, you yeah, know, yeah. some of her best work. It was her best yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I desperately wanted a twin. You know, I thought like my parents were still together, but I had this sort of fantasy that they'd given up my twin sister and I was going to meet her one day. Um, but of course, that did not happen. Um, I'd also been reading books about girls on a horse farm. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted a horse, and that definitely wasn't going to happen. And then I'd also, my mom one day brought home this, uh, this Bollywood film called Kabi Kushi Kabi Gum, and I, like, I loved it. I, my extra, like, I switched from watching Disney movies to every day for three years. I would put it on, I would sit there, I would sing the songs, I would be like, Shaba, Shaba. You know, like, like when I could sing these songs in Hindi, I didn't know anything, but I desperately wanted a sari, and of course, that wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So my very first story ever was basically the Parent Trap fan fiction. And I started with two twins. Their names were Marilyn and Carolyn. But by the end, they were Tommy and Tommy. Nice. You know, they were wearing these beautiful saris. They had to gallop this black horse into a storm. And, you know, it was like, Tommy called out to her twin. Tommy, help me. OK, tell, you know. So it's like the very first story, I had no problem putting myself in there yeah. and loving myself enough to literally double myself. Yeah. But then but, I was yeah. reading that you, you, after that moment, you didn't write a black character until you were 18. So it's yeah. quite a, a long gap. Exactly. And it was like, because when I discovered that story, it was very, you know, I was, oh, this is crazy. And like, you know, that was funny. But then it was sad because I saw the big gap in how I went from putting myself in a story twice to still writing the adventures I wanted to have. You know, I would still be like, oh, I want a dragon. So I'd write a story with a dragon. But I was no longer writing myself. I would write someone who was white or biracial. Right. And I knew, you know, when I unpacked that when I was like 18, I knew it wasn't just because, like part of it was never seeing myself. I had internalized that mm -hmm. black people couldn't be in books, black people couldn't have adventures. But I knew another part of that was that was part of the fantasy too. So me writing myself as a white character right. was the fantasy of like, oh, I want to be white and I want to be a dragon. And, mm -hmm. you know, both, one of those is okay. <laughs> one of those, that I maybe could be a dragon one day, but like I cannot be white one day. So it was this, I, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that if little Tomi had had a book like this, then she probably would have known, you know, she probably wouldn't have spent 10 years writing herself out of her stories or writing to be someone else in stories. And so when little Ava Ray comes up and is telling me about all the stories she's written and all the stories she wants to write and even just the confidence yeah. to like, you know, skip a line of 80 people <laughs> and be like, okay, it is definitely my turn to talk. She kept coming back to, <laughs> like she would be like, so I have follow-ups, you know, and, and I loved her. So I couldn't even be like, oh, Ava, I don't know. I'd be like, okay, tell me everything. <laughs> no, but in the video, yeah. you're like staring into her eyes. Like, yeah, I'm it's just like, especially Especially with the little British voice too, it's like yeah. that was too much. Like if she had had a little American voice, it would have been everything. But the fact that like when she said, uh, it was like, oh, and I'm like, oh. Tommy, Tommy has been doing a really, really bad British accent. Like, um, <laughs> I mean, a really good British accent. Okay, too, so yeah, I, I think that's what you meant. Like yeah. so good, it's bad. <laughs>
picking it up from all around the UK. Yeah. Um, so it, it sounds a little bit Australian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like this canon of the Lindsay Lohan of Lindsay <laughs> Lohan's work that they just <laughs> do. I would question why Freaky Friday was not the film that they mentioned, but yes. that's just mm. me. Contentious choice. <laughs> yeah. I think we might need a separate podcast to discuss <laughs> Lindsay Lohan. delving into her works. I just thought that was—I mean—an amazing atmosphere. You can hear that a bit, yeah. um, mm. and I think that idea of a young black girl being able to go up to a, a, a still quite young black author and and see herself, mm. to sort of see writing as a possibility. Because I hear so often from writers a couple of generations above talking about not seeing that as a job for them and it having taken them so much longer, therefore, to actually have the confidence to, to put pen to paper. That is absolutely my favourite part of doing events at Waterstones is being, and Dan is nodding in agreement, that it's being able to put people in the place that they can meet those authors that are inspiring them or mm. go on to inspire either their reading habits, their kind of choices mm. through whatever path they take or those job choices that they make. It's really special to be yeah. able to do it. One of my favourite events that I've done since being here at Piccadilly is we took another Waterstones Children's Book Prize winner, Angie Thomas, mm -hmm. um, author of The Hate You Give, and more recently, On the Come Up, mm -hmm. I think I got that right, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> to a school, um, King Solomon Academy. Um, and it was just fantastic to see, because I kind of stood up and introduced Angie, and then Angie comes onto the stage, and you could see all the kids kind of slump back in their chairs, you know, just kind of like, we've been told to be here. And she opens by, like, the slides come up, and it's just like a picture of Tupac, and you just see all of them kind of go, Hmm. <laughs> what what are we, what is this? And it's just like a complete it's it's you know, it's not the Dickens they're studying, it's not yeah. whatever mm. they're reading for school. It's like, oh, this is literature I can engage with and it's like Angie rapping on stage or whatever. And mm. it was just incredible to see the kind of the switch that 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 can bring about mm. yeah it's important isn't it I, I, I was at the elizabeth garrett anderson school when um michelle obama oh, yes, came across yeah. to, to talk about her book becoming and to see that group of children it was an all-female school and um predominantly um black and minority ethnic students as well and to have her come to this school and talk to them you could see it was the most inspiring mm. and incredible event that had probably mm. happened in a lot of their lives and what was interesting was before she even came on stage, they were all standing up and being asked by their teachers to make pledges to each other about what they were going to do to improve the school. And this was as a result of you know, being inspired by what Michelle Obama was doing. And I was amazed by the confidence of these young girls who, who looked quite shy, but actually given a microphone and inspired by somebody like Michelle Obama coming to their school, they made these incredibly honest um, and heartfelt pledges to each mm. other about how they were going to stop mm. bullying, how they were going to make sure that the school was a good place to be, that they were going to follow their hearts and all the rest of it. You know, it was just great. Yeah. I don't remember school being like that at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd stood up and said anything like that in assembly, you'd have just been... Booed off. And booed off. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Well, we at the end of each episode, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little tour of the country and hear from our booksellers, because, of course, with each of these different themes, we think that we can give you some good book recommendations based on that word. There'll be quite a wide range of authors covered, we hope. Uh, and remember that whatever it is you happen to be looking for, it's always worth asking a bookseller. Hi, I'm Georgina from Leeds, and the book I'd like to recommend for beginnings is The Bad Beginning by Lemony Snicket because it's the beginning of a classic children's series and the start of the horrors that face the Baudelaire orphans. Hi, my name is Chris and uh, I'm from Cardiff. And for beginnings, um, I've chosen Tales of the City by Armistead Mopin. Adventurously romantic, outrageously touching. It's the first in the series of the Barbary Lane books, which are amazing. Hi, I'm Katrina from Glasgow. And my recommendation on the topic of new beginnings is Dear E.J. Willey, or a Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Well, it started really as a response to a friend who had asked her to help write something that she could give to her new daughter that would mean she lived her life from the very beginning as a feminist. It's beautiful and powerful and it'll only take you one long bus read to finish. So there we go. We have begun, That's officially. Yeah. Um, David, thank you so much for helping <clears throat> us off to such a great start. It was really good to speak uh, to it you. It was a pleasure. Was, I'm, I'm honoured. <laughs>
<laughs> well, I want to say thank you for Sweet Sorrow as well because it, it brought back a lot of memories for me of, of um, well, being involved in theatre but also I think because of the fact that your protagonist thinks that acting is ridiculous yeah. and this group of people, is, it reminded me how ridiculous actors are <laughs> because you've got this kind of outside eye of the whole way it works and it was just, it made me laugh an oh, awful good. lot. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, thank you Holly and Dan uh, for joining me. Um, you have to go off now and prepare for our next episode which is going to be all about friendship. So have a little think about okay. that. Homework. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have homework. Um, we'll be hearing from Angie Thomas, who we just mentioned, uh, Tash Orr, uh, and together with them will be Yomi Odegake and Elizabeth Yuva Benene. Uh, now, because we are absolute beginners ourselves, we would love to hear your feedback. So do please get in touch with us via email, and you can do that on social at waterstones.com. And you can, of course, leave a rating or a review on your podcast platform of choice. Our next episode will be here in a couple of weeks. So until then, take care and goodbye from all of us here. Bye. Bye-bye. Farewell. So long. Thank you.